Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this final study of this week. As we open the word of the Lord, as we look at the symbols that he is presenting before us, shall we then ask his guidance so that we may more fully understand that which he would have us to know? Shall we ask for his direction and his blessing at this time? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we assemble before you and we thank you for the many blessings that you are providing. We ask, Father, for your guidance and your direction so that as we consider the words of your prophets, we might be directly blessed by that which you would have us to understand. May your angels attend us. We ask, Father, for your guidance. Please be with us now, wherever we are. Show us, Father, that which you would have us to understand. May your spirit open our minds so that that on which we contemplate may become clear. May your will be done. We ask that we be able to honor your character in all that we see and all that we do. Direct us now. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Much of what we're going to look at today is going to involve symbols. There are some specific reasons why we're going to go back over some of this information. Now, the question was asked in yesterday's meeting based upon the presentations that were done Tuesday and Wednesday as to when Uriah Smith had begun the discourse that became the book Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. Now, from what I have read and what I had been led to read, Smith began these somewhere in the late 1860s as a Sabbath school lesson. And then these began to be published in the Review and Herald. Now, the first portion of this was published on the 16th of May of 1871. Now, as we have been addressing many items, numbers as symbols have absolutely no relevance to anything we're doing these days, right? And I ask this question very sarcastically. This first portion that Smith addressed from Daniel 12 is written in three pages, and it covers only the first verse. Now, as we as we tend to look at this, I want you to consider, please, the fact that when Smith wrote this, the only portion that is not of Smith is where I am noting here, Review and Herald, and the published date of 16 May of 1871. Everything else is Smith's words or was in the original publishment. Yet, at this time, this document now has a total of 1,533 words. Does this number have any relevance for us today? What was that number again? One, five, three, three. Oh, yeah. 1533, yeah. Because 1533 in a different arrangement becomes 1335, right? Yep. Yeah. And, and of course, 1533 days from August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844. I, I did also the date that they came out of um, um, Egypt. Yeah. Okay. So here we have a document. I, I, Go ahead. Dwight, I, I'd just like to ask a question that's always wondered about is 1535, 13. What were the two numbers you mentioned again? 1335, which we find at the end of Daniel 12. And before that number, 1535? 1533. 1530. So what's, how do we, is there a list of rules of how we, decide to rearrange numbers and such it just seems kind of uh, uh, interesting or yeah, I, so, I wonder how that worked so in the studies we did uh at the camp meeting last year telford muse um iran went through that how how we we deal with numbers and one of the things we found was this thing called capricar's constant and i'm not going to go into it right now but it it deals with just an iteration of numbers. So we, we, we were finding that numbers can be arranged. For instance, here, this is published May 16th, 1871. And so one is you can read a, a date forward.
forwards and backwards. You can read numbers forwards and backwards, right? A mirror. But 1871 itself is 187. And then if you go backwards and you go 178 on the other the other direction, and you add 187 and 178 together, you get 365, the number of days in a year. But, you know, so we can rearrange numbers. 178. But yeah. 187 one is 365. 78, that's not so, backwards. 70, one yeah, seven from, eight, if you look eight, at 1871 there, you can see 187. Mm -hmm. 187, and you go yeah. 178. You go backwards, 178. But, but and that's, that's because totally there is Wouldn't it be 187 days. 178. No, I'm not, I'm one not putting the one seven. in there. Oh, I, like the, yeah, yeah. So, oh, and anyway, see from I, the I spring equinox to the, to the autumn. I, I won't distract yeah. too long. But I'll just explain this one thing. So uh, from... Thing, but the, rather, uh, maybe someone could post a link or something for the presentation where Ron did them. He could do that. Or, or Ron, maybe you could yeah. text me something. Thanks. Well, yeah, I, I can post a link to the notes. I can post a link to the notes. So I'll do that. In the, okay. in the YouTube thing or something. So, okay. Thanks, guys. Just, okay. just here. No, we'll, I'll send you a link right away. Now, in this situation, as I said at the outset, this document, these three pages, cover only what Smith had seen regarding verse 1. Now, it's been intriguing for me to find the articles as they were published and to look them over. I will show you some reasons behind why they're intriguing in a moment. Now, the other thing that I have noted, and I greatly encourage people to do, I will be sending these original, the, these copies of the Review and Herald documents out by email after the meeting. What's intriguing for me about this is that there are differences within specific paragraphs from what Smith presented in the Review and Herald and the document that we considered at the beginning of the week that was from Smith's published version of this tome in 1897. Some of these are just changes in verbiage. Some of them are direct content changes. We will go over some of this very briefly. Now, Smith, as this was being prepared for publication, had added here, chapter 12 continued from number 15. And what we'll, what we'll have to address in the near future is the fact that many of the Review and Herald articles, the papers, were numbered to a certain number, and then the numbering began again. So... What's being shown here is that there was a delay from the completion of Daniel 11, inclusive of verse 45, to the point that Daniel 12 was being published for the readers. Now, as, as we were speaking yesterday, uh, the other day, verse 1 covers a time period that is out of order of many of the events that we see later in this particular chapter. Yet Smith writes, a definite time is introduced in this verse at that time. What time? The time to which we are brought in the closing verse of the preceding chapter, the time when the king of the north shall plant the tabernacles of his palace in the glorious holy mountain, or in other words, when the Turk, driven from Europe, shall hastily make Jerusalem his temporary seat of government. We noticed in remarks upon the latter portion of the preceding chapter some of the agencies already in operation for the accomplishment of this end and some of the indications that the Turks will very soon be obliged to make this move. When this event takes place then, according to this verse, we look for the standing up of Michael, the great prince. We see this verse a little differently than Smith did from the studies that we have had. Is that correct? Right, but quite differently, yeah. Again, I, I am using sarcasm. Yes, I know. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. You, you also notice that he's using, he's doing it literally. He ain't doing it spiritually. Amen, brother. Correct. Yeah. Now, um, in some ways, and I mean, we should, and you probably will do that. I mean, we should go back to where he departs from from things, which is verse 36 of chapter 11. And, but we've talked about it before. So um, what, what we may be able to do, Theodore, if if this works for everybody, I may have the time to be able to go back from verses 36 to 45 and take yeah. a look at his published articles from 1870 and 1871 and possibly have those ready for Sabbath. Yeah. So when does he first, um, uh, when does this series begin? Because it's number 15. Okay. Uh, no, the number yeah. the number 15 was the ending of chapter 11. Yes. Yeah. This, so. this particular portion for Daniel 12 was published on the 16th of May of 1871. Yeah. And the first, the first chapter of Daniel? I haven't looked at, I, I've not found that quite yet. Oh, okay. I will look and I'll see if I can have an answer on that for Sabbath. Okay. Now, there will be a, there will be a comment that Smith makes in the review and Herald that will explain some of this situation, especially with this continued from number 15 addendum. So, Okay, comment from the chat. I think there also is a possibility that Christ stands up to encourage his martyrs during the 1260 years of papal tyranny and murder, as he did at Stephen's stoning in Acts 7. Um, I would, I would ask respectfully and not sarcastically that we consider that Christ stands up to encourage his living representative rather than his martyrs at that time, because it's kind of hard to encourage those that are dead. Other than that, I would agree with your comment. Yeah, well, now, I was just saying, of course, he'd be standing up to encourage them as they're dying for him. Or... I don't disagree with that. That's that's one of the reasons why I made my comment respectfully, and I was being very clear. I was not being sarcastic. Okay. Okay. Smith had continued here. Who then is Michael, and what is he standing up? What is his standing up? Here, Smith did not delineate much about the standing up, but he does note Michael is called in June 9 the archangel. This means the chief angel or the head of over the angels. There is but one. Who is he? He is the one whose voice is heard from heaven when the dead are raised, First Thessalonians 4.16. And whose voice is heard in connection with that event, the voice of our Lord Jesus Christ, John 5, 28. Tracing back the evidence with this fact is a basis. We reach the following conclusions. The voice of the Son of God is the voice of the archangel. The archangel then is the Son of God. But the archangel is Michael, hence Michael is also the Son of God. But the expression of Daniel, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, is alone sufficient to, it should be identify, then identify, the one here spoken of with the Savior of men. He is the prince of life, Acts 3.15, and God hath exalted him to be a prince and a savior, Acts 5.31. He is the great prince. There is no one greater than the sovereign father. Now, do we have a problem with this paragraph? Do we agree with what Smith has written here? Well, I mean, there's lots of little details that we would. Um... So this is going to be something for our consideration. We may have to return to this at some point in the future. And he yeah. st- go ahead. I just said, yeah. Okay. And he standeth for the children of thy people. He condescends to take the servants of God in this poor mortal state and redeem them for the subject of his his future kingdom. He stands for us. We are essential to his future purposes, an inseparable part of the purchased inheritance. And we are to be the chief agents of that joy in view of which Christ endured all the sacrifice and suffering, which has marked his intervention in behalf of the fallen race. Amazing honor. Be everlasting gratitude repaid him, 
for his condescension and mercy unto us. Be his the kingdom, power, and glory forever and ever. But now we come to the second question. What is the standing up of Michael? The key to the interpretation of this expression is furnished us in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 11. There shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. A mighty king shall stand up that shall reign with great dominion. There can be no doubt as to the meaning of these expressions in these instances. They mean to take the kingdom to reign. The same expression in the verse under consideration must mean the same. At that time, Michael shall stand up, shall take the kingdom, and shall commence his reign. But it is not Christ reigning now. Yes, associated with his father on the throne of universal dominion. Ephesians 1, 20 to 22, and Revelation 3, 21. But this throne or kingdom he gives up at the end of this dispensation, 2 Corinthians 15, 24. And then he commences his reign brought to view in the text when he stands up or takes his own kingdom, the long promised throne of his father, David, and establishes a dominion of which there shall be no end. Luke 1, 32 and 33. Okay. Now, what was noted from the chat, the biblical date of 15th of May, 1871, is the 25th day of the second month. Yeah, it should, should should be the 16th of May. I typed it wrong. Okay. So the date of this book is 252. Okay. On the biblical. Sorry about that. Okay, but thank you. That point, this particular article begins with a symbol of 2520. Do we all understand that? Clear to me. Okay. And thank you for pointing out that when this article was being transcribed, because I copied it, that this portion that says Second Corinthians 15.24 should be First Corinthians 15.34. Now, okay, on the Islamic, I, I'm not understanding. My mind's just a little foggy this morning. On the Islamic calendar, it's also the 25th day of the second month. Interesting. So let's let's ask this question. Is this not a repeat or a doubling to catch our attention? Uh, also on the rabbinic as well. So, so all so, three, agree, which is very rare that they all three agree to the same date. Now, keep this fact in mind. All three calendars on the date of the 16th of May of 1871 agree that this is the 25th day of the second month. Very rarely that all three are in agreement, but all three are now pointing to 252. Now, Smith's point that Christ shall stand up to begin his reign, we consider it that when Christ stands up, he leaves his office as our high priest, and that no more is there an intercessor between God and man. Do we all agree with that? Or is my understanding faulty? Yeah, when 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 yeah, when when he he stands up, that's the end of the intercession between God and man. Okay. Into an examination of all the events that constitute or are in separately connected with this change in the position of our Lord, it is not necessary that we enter that we here enter. Suffice it to say that then the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. His priestly robes are laid aside for royal vesture. The work of mercy is done and the probation of our race is ended. Then he that is filthy is beyond hope of recovery and he that is holy is in beyond the danger of falling. All cases are then decided. And from that time on, till the terrified nations behold the majestic form of their insulted king in the clouds of heaven, a time of trouble such as never was, a series of judgments unparalleled in this world's history, culminating in the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven in flaming fire to take vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel, accomplish the work of breaking the nations with a rod of iron and dashing them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Okay, the comment from the chat. 
and I, I would like some comments from everyone else on this, says, how can Uriah Smith, how Uriah Smith can compare Christ taking his kingdom and Turkey occupying and reigning from Jerusalem is beyond me. Has anyone else considered that? Well, yeah, there's just, there's so many problems here. It, it's, it's kind of hard, hard to know where to start. <laughs> but, you know, there are people who, who take this as inspired. Right. So they're, they're going to ex- accept this. And so I <clears throat> have discussed with people who are, are seeing this as, you know, what's happening right now is that Jerusalem's going to be taken over by Islamic forces and, and that's going to bring about the close of probation. So there are people who actually believe this. So I think part of, part of the problem with this, uh, sorry, um, is that in really understanding how last day events unfold, I mean, he's not, he's not really addressing the Sunday law or anything like that. In any regard, right. Now, of course, to be fair, in 1871, this is before Ellen White's writings of the Great Controversy. But is it before the writings of the books called Spirit of Prophecy? Yes, it's before that. That's what I'm talking about, the Great Controversy in 1884. So it's going to be another 13 years before she writes out that uh, book. And initially, when Ellen White first starts talking about the Sunday Law, and Adventists are talking about it. They're placing the Sunday law only after the close of probation, right? They they don't have the national Sunday law until the 1880s that Ellen White first talks about a Sunday law that occurs before the close of probation. So I did research on this. Okay. Um, because that understanding unfolded as time went on. So when they first are placing the Sunday law, that final test, they're going to put it during the time of Jacob's trouble. But Ellen White in the Great Controversy has shown that that Sunday, there's going to be the progression of these Sunday laws. And it first begins in the United States prior to the close of probation. So at this time, Uriah Smith isn't really going to understand that because no Adventists do. But so this idea that, that he has back here really is just more in line with Alexander Keith and it really doesn't have anything to do with Adventism um, except that they're connecting this to the sanctuary. Okay. Thus momentous are the events introduced by the standing up of Michael and thus he stands up or takes his kingdom, marking the introduction of this decisive period in human history for some length of time before he returns personally to this earth. How important then that we have a knowledge of his position, be able to trace the progress of his work and understand when that thrilling moment draws near, which ends his intersection in behalf of mankind and fixes our destiny forever. Now, this is interesting for me because I had only begun the comparison of his 1897 published book and these articles briefly yesterday afternoon. I did not get very far in in this portion because I had to first find it. We will go to another portion where there are some changes, but I would suggest after these are sent out that we each take some time and consider to check between what he is writing here in 1871 and what remained published in 18. 97. But how are we to know this? How are we to determine what is transpiring in the far off heaven of heavens in the sanctuary above? God has been so good as to place the means of knowing this in our hands. When certain great events transpire on earth, he has told us what events synchronizing with them transpire in heaven. By things which are seen, we thus learn of things that are unseen. As we look through nature up to nature's God, so through terrestrial phenomena and mundane movements, we trace the occurrence of heavenly scenes. When the king of the north plants the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, a movement for which we already see the preparatory steps, then Michael, our Lord, stands up and receives from his father the kingdom 
preparatory to his return to this earth. Or it might have been expressed in other words. Then our Lord ceases his work as our great high priest, and the probation of the race is finished. The great prophecy of the 2300 days gives us definitely the commencement of the final division of the work in the sanctuary in heaven. The verse before us gives us data whereby we can judge approximately of its close. Would we accept his position within this paragraph completely? Well, no. So, I mean, because he's obviously talking about certain events and the certain events that uh, that have to take place is his idea that we're going to have Turkey taking up, uh, you know, going to Jerusalem and making Jerusalem its its tabernacle. So when he says, when the king of the north, that is Turkey, plants the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. So one, one of the problems here, I mean, just historically, I mean, Islam already took over Jerusalem many times, right? Correct. So he's going to ignore the times in the past, and he's going to say, well, it's once the 2300 days has begun. And we already have the Dome of the Rock there in Jerusalem. Jerusalem had been divided into three different groups, being able, like Christians, Jews, and Muslims, sort of sharing the city. Though Jerusalem, the, the Jews have control over it. Now, prior to um, who had control of Jerusalem in that period, would have been it would have been Britain had control of Jerusalem prior to that. I believe so. So they're just saying that all of Jerusalem is going to be controlled by Turkey. You know, even if people try to say, well, it's going to be Iran. Iran is not Turkey. Like, is is Turkey even in in any sort of position to put its the tabernacle of its palaces in Jerusalem? No. Yeah. Is Islam in any kind of position to do this within Jerusalem? Well, I mean, if they were going to do that, um, I mean, there definitely would be a war. But but this he's not talking about Islam. He's talking about Turkey. Right. Right. So, you know, of course, the Turk, he can say the Turk. But but really, Turkey isn't in that, uh, you know, at that time. And, and so when Uriah Smith, all the time he's writing, you know, Turkey was still sort of in play. But now we would say no. But, you know, I mean, it's not so much about what God's word says and, you know, comparing it to what's happening. The question is, is God's word even saying any of this? And I would have to say that this this what he's drawing here, because the premise is all wrong. The king of the north cannot possibly be turkey. So, I mean, we've gone through that, but it, it creates all kinds of problems. It creates a multitude of problems. But, the, you know, this idea that he's just taking this so the king of the north, literally, I mean, we do have to go back and look at his arguments right from the beginning. I also think we should, because we did this when we were examining the foundation and we looked at the pioneer's view of this. So Uriah Smith is repeating Josiah Litch's understanding. But Josiah Litch's understanding is just Alexander Keith. He's just basically quotes this Protestant uh uh, commentator so there's some modifications because you know it's much later right so this is now 40 years on from uh, when alexander keith was writing about about turkey and so forth so there's a few things that uriah smith adds as details but it's basically it's not supported in the spirit of prophecy anywhere and that's where you know stephen had shown us these uh, quotes that people use just where, you know, Elder Smith is speaking on the Eastern question. But I think it's more than just like there are parts of what of this issue that Ella White could support, but she's not going to support this, this part of it. The Eastern question is is actually a little broader than just what we're studying here. I was going to say, isn't doesn't the Eastern question involve more than Turkey? Something about uh, groups wanting to go to, Jer to Jerusalem? Like, it, like you say, it was is broad. It's not just about yeah. Turkey. Well, Ellen White, 
the whole idea that literal Jerusalem has any part of prophecy would be rejected by the spirit of prophecy. So, um, right. yeah, so we need to understand a bit more what this Eastern question is, because people have just narrowly focused it to this whole issue of what this paragraph, basically, about Turkey coming in and taking over Jerusalem and that being when Christ stands up. It, it definitely is much more than that. Um, but exactly what Ellen White is saying when she's she's giving at least some support to what Uriah Smith is doing in his presentations, because there's lots of interest in this Eastern question. And we need to historically understand that in more detail. So there's lots of things we still need to understand more clearly, is all I'm saying. Sorry about that, Dwight. No, you're fine. You are well, fine. I'm sorry, because you're, I'm creating more work for you. <laughs> well, there, there's a lot of things that came up from the last couple of days' studies that I've begun looking into. And the theme of what we're going to consider with all of this, here is the understanding that we have that Uriah Smith had presented from 1871. It's interesting when you begin to look at this as to where many of the, the, quote, theologians, unquote, within the church currently stand on Daniel 12. And we may have time to examine many of their positions over the next several days. Because yeah, that's because that's part of the um, this idea that, that you know, the pioneers, because when we examine the foundation, I mean, we had basically Josiah Litch, who was was holding this position. Right. So, you know, we say, what's the pioneer's position? Well, a pioneer promoted these these ideas regarding uh, the king of the north being Turkey. But we couldn't say that that was the position of the pioneers. Because there's lots of things that are published in Millerite writing that um, uh, were not com were not generally held views, even if just Lich published an article. It doesn't mean that everybody agreed with it. Um, so that's, you know, that's part of the problem, is that there is not, on every issue, complete agreement. They, they throw out lots of, of options of things to understand, lots of studies um, that aren't, you know, officially sanctioned, so to speak. There isn't an official position on every single point. Because it's it's a living movement. It was growing in their understanding, and they were willing to examine all kinds of things. So, but one thing we did see is that this did not fit in with Miller's rules. That they they weren't really following Miller's rules in order to derive the idea that Daniel eleven verse thirty six referred to France as the king of the north, or not as king of the north as as the atheistic power making Turkey the king of the north and Egypt the king of the south. So there was just not, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a generally held view. It wasn't considered, you know, Miller never talks about it, for instance. I know Dwight left briefly. I don't know when he's going to be back here. So I'm more persuaded than ever that Trump will not bring a Sunday law in if he is elected and that... Uh, Turkey will, or Islam will have no success in trying to take anything over in Israel. Uh, yeah. after listening to, to Victor Davis Hansen today, uh, it's only the second time I've ever heard of, heard of him and heard him speak, but he was so factual and insightful and he has, you know, he has an ear to the ground. He's, he, he talks to these people that are in power and so on. But boy, he laid it out so clear that I'm. How many presidents have we said as Seventh Day Adventists? It's going to be Reagan or it's going to be whoever. It's got to be this president. Yeah. He's going to do it. So I think I think that's that says something too. I mean, we should that should, that enough should give us pause to say any president is this is the one. I mean, we've been wrong. Yeah. Well, well earlier on in, in, yeah, so earlier on in these um, 
studies when we started studying we we first dealt with what Colin was saying about uh well didn't first but we got to revelation 17 to the riddle you know the five are fallen one is the other's not yet come but when he comes he continues the short space space and then you're going to yeah. have the eight he is of the seven which doesn't mean he's one of the seven he's not one of the presidents the eighth is the power that is going to uh, uh be the papacy the papacy is the power that is going to bring that's going to be in power when the Sunday law comes. So the Sunday law is in connection with the papacy. So in, in looking at that, those presidents, we, we believe them to be the presidents of the United States. Well, Trump is not the seventh. He's the sixth. It was that how it is. No, wait, hang on. Five or fault. No, Trump is the fifth. Biden's the sixth. And then the seventh is the next one, which could be Trump. I'm just trying to remember how we did that. So Trump could become president, but the seventh is not the one who brings in the Sunday law, is my point. So so we're, we're going to have to go through some of these things again later on. I'm working on the notes right now, so I'm trying to go over everything that we studied since we started this study in uh, in August. I think the first study we did on this was August 6th in 2023 that we started this series. Okay. Is the white back yet? Okay. I'm back. I'm here. Yes. Okay. Now, I, I don't see. I missed, I, I missed a little bit of the conversation. Uh, one comment from the chat. Did Uriah Smith envision a Friday law according to Muslim rule instead of a Sunday law? From what I've seen so far, I would have to say the answer was no. Now, in connection with the standing up of Michael, there occurs a time of trouble such as never was. In Matthew 24, 21, we read of a period of tribulation such as never was before it, nor should be after it. This tribulation filled with the, filled in the oppression and slaughter of the church by the papal power is already past. While the time of trouble of Daniel 12, 1 is, according to the view we take, still future. How can there be two times of trouble many years apart, each of them greater than any that had been before it or should be after it? To avoid difficulty here, let the distinction be carefully noted. The tribulation spoken of in Matthew is tribulation upon the church. Christ is speaking to his disciples and of his disciples in coming time. They were the ones involved in that trouble, and for their sake, The days of tribulation were to be shortened, verse 22. Whereas the time of trouble in Daniel is not a time of religious persecution, but of national calamity. There has been nothing like it since there was not a church, but a nation. This comes upon the world. This is the last trouble to come upon the world. In Matthew, there is reference made to time beyond that tribulation. For there was never to be any like that upon the people of God in the future after that was past. But there is no reference in Daniel to future time after the trouble there mentioned. For that closes up the world's history. It includes the seven last plagues of Revelation 16 and culminates in the revelation of the Lord Jesus coming upon his pathway of clouds in flaming fire, to visit destruction upon his enemies who would not have him to reign over them. But out of this tribulation, every one shall be delivered who shall be found written in the book, the book of life. For in Mount Zion there shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant who call the Lord, whom the Lord shall call. Excuse me, Joel 2.32. Can we agree with what Smith is writing here? What do you think? No. It would be very difficult to agree with Smith on this one. Yeah, because you're going to have all of these people uh, being slaughtered by the papal power. Or wait, hang on. I'm just, um, I'm not sure if I understand him well. So he says there's not two times of trouble. Right. So he's going to have just one time of trouble. So he's going to have. He would seem to be addressing a that his that this time of trouble 
had been in the past during the 1260 years, and that was religious. And now he's trying to place a literal time of trouble, which would be political. And he's placing that where? After Christ stands up. Right, which, yeah, that's what I thought he was saying, which would be really contrary to what Ellen White has said. Yeah, that's why I was trying to figure out if he's actually saying this. So he's saying the, the tribulation spoken of in Matthew is the tribulation upon the church. So he's he's not having a little time of trouble then before the close of probation. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm having a hard time following his logic here. Okay, you ask, a, you ask a question to begin with, and I said I would try to answer it by Sabbath. Smith began his presentation, thoughts on the book of Daniel, 5th of January, 1868. That's the first what? published version of this. So quite a bit before. So the first published version of, of, the the, first. of just like chapter one? Or, yep. And it was January? Five of 1868. Yeah. So Smith has quite a, a time frame running from the 5th of January, 1868 through to 1871 mm -hmm. to publish his studies on his thoughts on the book of Daniel. Yeah. Now, where do you find this information about uh, the first publishing of it and things like that? Well, so that's going to be the Sabbath school quarterly in 1868. Is that what that is? No, the review and Herald. Well, just the review and Herald. Okay. So, but the review and Herald, they don't publish on a Sunday. It's a Sunday. January 5th, 1868. According to this, this would have been, this would have been a Tuesday, January 5th. 1868? Yep, that's, that's what the Review and Herald is saying. Third day, which would be Tuesday. Yeah, so, yeah, so January 5th is not a Tuesday. It's a Sunday in 1868. Yeah, I know. So there, so there's a typo somewhere. Right. Yeah, because if you went to uh, to the Tuesdays, January 7th, and January 14th, of course. So, yeah, it's hard to know what, what's going on there. Definitely it's not, not correct. Now, are these in the E.G. White disc then under Review and Herald? I could look it up, I guess. I'm taking this off of the Review and Herald archives. Okay. Yeah, because when you go to the E.G. White disc, it only goes to 1866. So it doesn't give us that year. I don't know why the E.G. White disc doesn't give us more, but okay. Yeah, okay. So we'll figure this out later. Okay, but as, as we've covered this portion of Daniel 12, verse 1, there are multiple things that we're seeing in the way that, that Smith has presented this that are causing us especially at this time to question what his point was and how he was attempting to present what he was seeing yeah and ellen white would not have agreed with this this is pretty clear that nobody would agree with this uh statement okay the question was asked in the chart or in the chat two sets of three years end of the civil war in 1865 and then three years to 1868 Uriah Smith's first installment of Daniel and Revelation in the Review and Herald, and then three years to 1871 for Daniel 12. Is there a parallel to some of these, of the threes that we find in Ezra? Yeah, I, I don't know if he would take the three years to the end of the Civil War and put that in here, but, but maybe the three years from, for the publishment of this, I don't know. Okay. But you would have to put it on a line. You'd have to have some really clear... You know, can't, you can't, just can't arbitrarily take three years. They have to be part of a line. There has to be things that connect them more clearly than that. Okay. Now, any other thoughts at this point about this portion on, on Daniel 12.1? I mean, I realize that that is a very deep question. And yes, there's a lot for us to consider here. So much of this, I will be leaving up to us individually to consider because there's so much that Smith is presenting here that is really not in line with what we've understood from Spirit of Prophecy or from what we have been studying recently as we've been going through Daniel 12. 
Yeah. So, I mean, I've read through, um, you know, Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith a couple of times. And, you know, it, it is the book that that is help, helpful. Obviously, this is an early writing of it, which you're not going to find much of this in his later book. Right. I mean, it's going to be uh, I don't remember him ever saying any of this stuff here regarding the period of tribulation, that there's just one period that it happens after Michael stands up. I don't know, because, you know, if there's editions of the book where this kind of idea was presented, because I'm not sure which editions of the book I've read. But in in the uh, so in so when we look at uh, this in because right here I'm going to have to use this computer. So did you you do the comparison to what we have generally in Daniel and Revelation by Uri Smith? Does this paragraph exist? I had I, I had not done the comparison yet hmm. to this. Because there there are four articles on Daniel 12. I have done the comparison with the last article written. And I will see about taking some time to do the comparison to look at this. And I'll, I'll, let me show you what what I have. Okay. Well, he does say this in, in the edition I have of Daniel and Revelation. Okay. Um, here's what he says on the time of trouble. Uh, in connection with the standing up of Michael, there occurs a time of trouble such as never was. In Matthew 24, 21, we read of a period of tribulation such as never was before it, nor should be after it. This tribulation, filled in the oppression and slaughter of the church by the papal power, is already past. While the time of trouble of Daniel 12, verse 1 is still future, according to the view we take. How can there be two times of trouble, many years apart, each of them greater than any that had been before it or should be after it? To avoid difficulty here, uh, let this distinction be carefully noticed. The tribulation spoken of in Matthew is the tribulation upon the church. Christ is there speaking to his disciples and of his disciples in coming time, right? So in the future, they were the ones involved. And for their sake, the days of tribulation were to be shortened. The time of trouble mentioned in Daniel is not a time of religious persecution, but of an international calamity. And there has been nothing like it since there was not a church, but a nation. Uh, This is the last trouble to come upon the world in its present state. In Matthew, there is reference made to a time beyond that tribulation. For after it is past, the people of God shall never go through another period of suffering like it. But there's no reference here in Daniel to future time after the trouble here mentioned, for it closes this world's history. It includes the seven last plagues of Revelation 16 and culminates in the revelation of the Lord Jesus coming in clouds of flaming fire to visit destruction upon his enemies. But out of this tribulation, everyone shall be delivered who shall be found written in the book, the book of life for in Mount Zion shall be deliverance. So, so, so basically it's the same. But he he's um, in the this original writing of it. He seems to be clearly saying that I'm not even I'm not even sure what he's clearly saying. <laughs> he seems to be implying that there is that there is no time of trouble. There is not a time of trouble before the close of probation. That that the persecution. I'm, I'm not I'm not sure what he's trying to say. I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> If that's if that's helpful. Right. He, he's clear in this writing. So it's very similar, but there's things he's not saying here. I'd have to compare them side by side. OK, well, in, the, in this final article, when I went through it, I did compare side by side and all of the changes that I found, I highlighted. Now, it was interesting to me when I came to the final paragraph on Daniel 12, that there was a break noted, and then Smith makes the following comment. After many interruptions and delays, which have been unpleasant to the writer, and have doubtless detracted from the interest which any may have felt in these articles, we at length draw the thoughts on Daniel to a close. 
So here again, Smith is making a personal comment. Now, the following portion is noted that with sm no small degree of satisfaction, we have spent what time and study we have on this wonderful prophecy. And in contemplating the character of this most beloved of men and most illustrious of prophets, God is no respecter of persons, and a reproduction of Daniel's character will equally secure the favor of God. Let us emulate his virtues that we, like him, may have the approbation of God while here and dwell amidst the creations of his infinite glory in the long hereafter. Now, many of the articles, not all, but many, carried his initials, U.S. Now, this is an identifier for us because, as we are aware, there was a point about 1863 where there had become a confusion as to whether it was James White writing articles or whether it was Uriah Smith writing articles. James 1864. 1864. Okay. Thank you for correcting me. Now, in these situations, in order not to have such confusion, Elder White chose to place his initials on his articles, and it's interesting that Smith would so follow. Yeah, because the, the issue there in um, January, what is the date? January 20-something, where we have the article that's addressing Leviticus 26. Right. That's, that the E.G. White disc just says it's James White because he's he's the editor. His name is on the masthead. But actually, he's not the editor at that time. It's Uriah Smith because... Uh, with their son uh, Henry passing away in December of 1863, James is traveling with Ellen White, and so he's not he's not the editor at that time. But Uriah Smith, you know, that's early on. He's a pretty young guy. They don't change. They just leave James White as the editor. So officially, whoever writes the editorial, the unsigned article, is is the author. But sometimes. Uriah Smith was writing these articles and it wasn't clear if it was Uriah Smith or James White. And in this case, it was Uriah Smith who wrote that article against Leviticus 26, not James White. Right. And, and you can tell easily because he's going to uh, talk about um, uh, Jesenius, the lexicon and, and the use of the Hebrew. And James White would not do that. It was, you know, Smith's stated intent in that article to set aside any belief in anything having to do with the seven times of Leviticus 26, meaning 2,520 years. Yeah. And James White never repudiated, uh, you know, never set aside the 2520 in, you know, in later years. Uh, Correct. I think it's 1878 that he publishes his book on Miller, and he he definitely uh, does not oppose uh, the 2520 and and repeats that these prophetic periods are correct that Miller taught. So there is a reference to the seven times Leviticus 26 as being true, uh, part of Miller's um, understanding. So. So it doesn't seem likely to me that James White wrote that article. But also the style of writing is not James White's style. Right. Right. So it's um, – but but because because they don't put who is the one who wrote the article, it, it's going to show up as a default as James White wrote it. Correct. Because he's actually the editor, right? And so that's why people thought James White wrote that article. I mean, no. we have to realize how early on that is within – uh, you know, Adventism. I mean, it's, um, and, and in the publishing of the Review and Herald, they just, they hadn't set up any way to know who wrote it. So. Right. And it's, it, it's kind of the, like the adage about closing the barn after the horse has gotten out. So at that point, once this became a type of controversy, 
the decision was made that we have to identify the authors of our articles. Mm -hmm. Now, there are multiple highlights that I have made within this portion of the article. I am ready to be corrected by anyone that wishes to point out if, if I've made a mistake. Now, the date that's assigned to this article is of no relevance to us whatsoever. It has absolutely nothing to do with anything that we've been addressing. Now, at the initial portion that we were, we were talking about today on the article on Daniel 12, we find that the, the Hebrew calendar, the biblical calendar, and the Islamic calendar all came to what date? Well, the 25th day of the second month. Okay. Now, this article, again, the date has absolutely nothing to do with anything we've been talking about. So the date of 18th of July, 1871, means absolutely nothing to us, right? Well, I think it means something. So what does it mean? What do we see? So, well, we got July 18, and we have 187, and we have 178. We have all of the di- – everything there is 18 eight and 7. Yep. Right, so we got a doubling of July 18. Isn't it interesting that we would find that this particular chapter begins on a date that is the 25th day of the second month, and it ends in reference to 187? July 18th, double. Yeah. Anyone else have any thoughts on this? Now, the point that I'm in, I am I was intrigued by. Uh, I got something here, Dwight. Go ahead. I wish Zoom had a 30-second reverse or whatever. What, what was the uh, numbers there that you were drawing up there again? 187. Yes. Okay, so July 18th, as we have gone through the situation of July 18th, 2020. So here we have, we have this article published on the 18th of July of 1871. So we oh. have one. Does that make sense, Kelly? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I missed the first year, first year you mentioned. Okay. 1871. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, thanks. Now, yeah, the, and it's 1290 days from January 5th, 1868. Really? 1290 days? Yeah. It's and, 60, from, and 63 days from uh, May 16th, 1871. Sorry, 1290 days from where? The first, the first article, the date that they gave us for the first article. The first chapter one, verse one of Dan. 1868. Sorry. 1860. No, no. The one, 1871. And then 1868. Is when he first. first Yeah, when he starts this series. Oh, okay. Okay. On the number seven or 2520 or. Seven times? Daniel chapter, Dan, the book of Daniel. Sorry? It's his studies on the book of Daniel. Thoughts on the book of Daniel. Who? So he who, starts. Who studies it again? Who? So this is Uriah who Smith's thoughts, thoughts on the book of Daniel. Okay. Uriah Smith. Right. So he starts yeah. that in 1868 and finishes it 1290 days later. Let's look, look yeah, for a better audio exactly platform. <laughs> It's exactly a year since the declaration of papal infallibility to uh, July 18th, 1871. So they, they did their papal infallibility on the 18th of July of 1870? Yeah. Recall. Yeah, that's correct. Now, brothers and sisters, how many of these dates of these symbols can just be applied to mere chance. Yeah. And it's 63 days between March 16th, 1871 and July 18, 1871. So you got half of the 12, and, the one, six. Exactly. And an, answer, and an answer to your question, Dwight, uh, I'd say that 
what I see increasingly is Talmoni. So the possibility, which we always have to leave room of it being chance, but no, it's just, it's nailing it down so well. Yeah. So here we are. There are many of us that are choosing to remain in study. All of these items have been before us, have been available to us for years. How does Mrs. White say it? We are to search the scriptures as a miner searching for gold. Do we in, in the time of in the time of the season of God's time because he's also revealing more i believe you know light is increasing because of god too right. right mainly right he's in all of it yeah sorry to interrupt there but yeah that struck me do we just find gold laying on the ground do we ever find gold laying on the ground is it true that antediluvians did but not us i'm speaking of us right now yeah I, yes uh, i understand I was, just, I was just thinking uh did the antediluvians, was the gold on the surface and so abundant and so on, and God buried it under the mountains to protect man from his own greed? In our situation, so many of these symbols are coming to the forefront now because we need to know in whom our confidence rests. Are we willing to have confidence in Palmoni? Or are we willing to have confidence in man? We have now seen that in these situations, in these articles, that there is a reference to the symbol of the 2520. We have multiple references to the validity of July 18th. We have multiple references or a reference to a symbol for the 126 and 126 being a tenth of the 1260, being half of the 2520. And the 1290 and the 1335 as well. Exactly. All of these numbers that are currently being set aside by the church, we are finding have been supported in so many different ways. If this is not reason enough for our faith, then we indeed have a problem. Yeah. Just to comment on that, so I know our time is up, but it's it's we are not primarily like taking these symbols and then creating a doctrine from it that's contrary to the scriptures. We already have understood certain things. These are always just confirmation. Exactly. Okay. Amen. So are there any other thoughts or comments at this time? Yeah, you just can't make all this stuff up. I agree. And we, we can't make it up, and it's not according to chance, right? Right. It, it reminds me, excuse me, right. It reminds me of uh, looking at something in creation and saying that it happened by chance. I mean, you can't. <laughs> right. It, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, William. Okay. Shall we now close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven. We praise you and we thank you for showing us that we can depend upon you in all ways and in all things. May your will be done. Help us now that we may do the things that you would want done. Guide our steps today. Show us where you would have us to walk so that we may more properly represent you today. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.